All right, great. Thank you for your patience if you have been waiting. And I'm gonna call the African Heritage Reparation Assembly meeting of Friday, June 17th at 2.11 p.m. to order. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. All right, so welcome. Let's just make sure um, everyone can be heard and can hear me. Uh, Dr. Shabazz. Yes, I can hear you. Great. Um, and Hala? I can hear you. Excellent. And Alexis? Yes, I can hear. Awesome. Okay. So um, I know that Yvonne was not able to meet. I thought that Irv was going to be here because um, he had given us, I think, the time of 2 p.m. So I did text him and maybe he'll be able to join us. But since we have a quorum, we should just get right into things. And um, I will report here that I am, maybe I look tired because I am. <laughs> um, I am working and my eyes are tired, really. I'm working on this document. So what I'm going to show you is a real work in progress, process. How do you all say that? Work in process or progress? <laughs> Progress? Progress, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, hopefully it's progress. <laughs> I like the process too, though. They both work. Right? <laughs> I say it different ways at different times. So um, so please uh, bear, yeah, bear with me that it's, it is, um, it is, uh, coming together, but it's very in a draft format right now. So I'm going to just go ahead. Actually, let me just pause before I bring it up and just see if there are any general questions or comments um, before we move right into the meat of what we're here to discuss today. And maybe there are questions about Juneteenth. Um, Hala, I would love for you to announce what you did to Angela, if you're open to that, um, about when you'll be participating over the next couple of days right now yeah <laughs> why not <laughs> i mean i think she asked me the question and i responded she did <laughs> you are correct the amherst area gospel choir and the goodwin memorial amy zion choir will be singing at the heritage trail stop when they come to goodwin at three o'clock tomorrow mm -hmm. and on the common for juneteenth at 12 o'clock on sunday look forward to seeing some of you and thank you awesome awesome um, and did anyone else have any other questions or comments about Juneteenth before we move on? That was on our agenda, so we, we are free to talk about that if needed. Okay, well, we can always come back to it. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with you in just a second here. All right, let's see. Oh, there we go. Okay. So right now you see my agenda, right? Is that what you're seeing? Okay, the agenda. All right. So this is the document that I'm working on here. And I'm going to move us through um, a lot of this. So a starting point for the discussion and for the memo or the sort of, yeah, so there will be a memo that I'll send to the finance committee that will include what we're proposing for a policy. Um, and there will be background information and context. And the first piece that you're seeing here is from a very interesting document that I recommend everybody to read and it's linkable here. So I'll, I'll, this will be in the packet, um, but it's called the financial management policies uh, document. And let me just see if I can link if it will open here. Yeah. 
So this is the financial management policies and objectives. And so these are the policies of the town related to the budget and anything that is financial in nature. And so um, there were some questions, as you know, that came up at our last meeting. I think that Sonia and Sean had posed with respect to certain percentages that needed to be in keeping uh, related to reserves. And so I wanted to pull that information out and see what uh, what they what they were referring to. And I have an email out to both Sonia and Sean to get some clarification. You re may remember they were talking about being concerned that um, there needed to be 5%. It, there was like that 5% piece. And so I looked at the financial projections for FY23, which is a, a budget planning report that was um, pre prepared and presented in November of 2021. And in that, it reported that the combined free cash and stabilization funds as of July 2021 is 23.1 million or 27% of the operating budget. So the question that I have out to them is that unless I'm missing something or I, I just am not making a connection, um, I'm not really sure why there was a concern when there seems to be um, more than enough in the fund. So I'm waiting to get clarification there because there certainly could be something I'm missing. Um, but that's where this kind of first part of this comes from here. And if you're interested, by the way, in that, that's that particular report is also really interesting. Um, and, you know, as I start to really dig into the finances of the town, it's very, it can be a lot, it's very overwhelming. Um, but it can also be really interesting, especially this report, because there's a lot of visuals. If you're in, you know, like me, you need visual um, but this is where I found that information here. Um, so you'll see that um, it tells us what the reserves, which healthy reserves it says, and that's free cash plus the stabilization fund. Yes, Dr. Shabazz. And I see that Irv has joined. Irv, can you hear us? I can hear you. Okay, welcome to the meeting. Um, Dr. Shabazz, please. Oh, we're, we're talking now, or, or this information is relevant to the first part of the kind of request we've made um, regarding until um, we can, until the FY24 uh, budget, where uh, if approved, we would have the cannabis revenue earmark that until that time, we're asking at the um, point where free cash is certified, that an amount equivalent uh, to that raised in cannabis revenue would go, would be directed to uh, the reparations uh, fund. So I, this, I, I take it, this is, this is relevant to that part of our request? That's a great question, Dr. Shabazz. And maybe I should have uh, not started here to make it clear that um, it is relevant to that request and it may be relevant to the larger request. And I'm gonna to get to that and, and open that up for discussion in, in a moment. So if we can just hold that uh, seed that Dr. Shabazz just planted and we're gonna come back to that in a minute. Thank you. Does that work? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, uh, hi Herb, I'm not sure when you joined um, because it's a little harder for me to see, but I was just, um, in the last finance committee meeting, when we were making our requests, there was some uh, there was some confusion about the policy of the town with respect to what needs to be in reserves, and so we were just talking a little bit about that and where um, I pulled that information from. So I'm going to move down here. Um, okay, so. I pulled the past and projected cannabis tax revenue from this FY23 budget because it shows us the past, it shows us where we're at currently, and then what's being projected um, all the way up through FY27. 
Uh, one of the, the policies that you'll see in that financial policy document, if you look at it, is that the, in, the, the finance department is encouraged to make conservative estimates um, when they're projecting out. So um, right here, you can see that we have an FY20, you can see what we had FY21, um, and that actually the FY21 was what they based our allocation last year off of. And then the FY22 is the recap that shows us what they have so far, I believe. Um, they are proposing 150 for FY23 uh, based on some competition in the area, based on one of the major recreational facilities going back to fully medical. Um, and then they're projecting from FY24 through FY27, $200,000 per year. Um, and again, I would say that's conservative. We can have up to eight recreational um, retail cannabis shops. So, um, and we have three. So that number can certainly go up, but this is what they're projecting. You'll also see a note here on Evanston, just to give us some context and comparison. So um, Evanston has made a $10 million commitment and you can see what their budget is, which is almost four times our budget. Um, and so here we get into parameters of use of the funds. So first and foremost, um, vetting they, the, the use of funds would be vetted by the African heritage community or members of the African um, state, the African heritage stakeholder body that we, I, I think we've sort of talked about as a successor body to our assembly, but we don't need to necessarily go into detail with that right now. Um, they'll need obviously to be legal. So if we're going to direct benefits, we'll um, have to make sure that that we're that it's legal to do so. Um, and then of course, in keeping with the guidance developed by the HRA, AHRA, which will be what we um, ultimately will report on um, throughout the, you know, throughout our time and in that final report. Um, I listed some pos, again, this is a very, very rough, this is not what it's gonna look like at the end. It's a work in, in progress, um, but some possible uses, I pulled these from the NCOBRA website from their local reparations guidance. Um, we, can, we can add to this, um, of course, these are just some possibilities here. I also included some other sources of revenue for AHRA, so um, CPA funds, grants, federal, state, or private, and then private funds, of course. Um, but that's, again, all going to come in a final report from the AHRA. For example, private funds, we may decide, or this body may decide, we don't, we wouldn't want private funds to be um, contributed into the municipal fund for whatever reasons. Okay. So here's where we get to sort of, as I started to work out the policy piece of things. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, so here we have, the way that I've started to think about this is adopting a policy for funding reparations. Okay, so that's really what the, that's really what we want the town council to do is we want them to, However, it's going to be done, we need to have a policy for funding reparations. Um, and so you'll see here that I put modeled from cannabis tax revenue, and I'm going to get to that in a second. But I have one option here where there's an annual appropriation from free cash. And then I have another option here where a new line item is created in the budget for reparations, which, as you may remember, a non voting finance committee member had recommended that as a possibility. Um, and then down here, I started to kind of work with, have a framework here. So if we assume a base appropriation of this amount, which is when we started this, the first ever appropriation was based off the FY21 actual cannabis tax revenue, 208,554. And then 
we are saying that there will be an annual, an annual review by the Finance Committee during the drafting of the budget policy guidelines. That's the most important document, really, in some sense, in my mind, um, because that's where the Finance Committee um, and the Town Council guide Sean and Paul in, and the Finance Department in the creation of their budget. And then depending on the financial position of the town, the finance committee can recommend the appropriation go up or down. I put 10%, that's just a number I threw in there. I'm just giving sort of some sense of a structure here. Um, the policy to be reviewed by GOL for recommendation at the beginning of each new cycle um, of council. And then the policy to expire when appropriations have reached X amount. Um, and I just want to give you a little bit of a background about where some of these um, kind of stipulations that I've put in here have come from. They're really very much in response to counselor feedback. They're in response to the financial health of the town currently. Um, they're in response to the need for us to be flexible and also recognize that there are other sources of revenue um, that we will want to pursue. So this is um, in particular to how the town is going to fund reparations through the general fund. Um, and so each one of these, um, like for example, an annual review, I talked about the budget policy guidelines, um, the looking at the financial position of the town, I think that it's going to be uh, difficult to pass a policy that the council doesn't feel there there's any flexibility to um, discern from year to year based on the financial position of the town. Um, and then also um, reviewing the full policy by GOL with each new council because there are concerns that what we do now, this policy we create, will sort of bind future councils. So this calls for a recommendation at the beginning of each new council on the policy. And then um, the policy to expire when appropriations have reached. I was really surprised to find that Evanston, um, their policy was made through a resolution. And I reached out to Alderwoman Robin Rue Simmons, who wrote that resolution, and asked her why she did it in as a resolution and not a policy, because resolutions are non-binding. And generally, they're symbolic in nature. And she said if she had, like, you know, I think she was a newer alderwoman and that if she had had more staff support, she may have created a policy. But what's really interesting is that on the good faith of that resolution, they're pursuing their goal. Um, and if you look at that resolution, and I have it linked here somewhere, you'll see that um, the language that's in there and that they've committed to an expiration of appropriations at $10 million. Um, and again, I just ask us to look at this, the difference in their budget and ours. Theirs is almost four times higher than ours. So just thinking about that. Um, so I'm going to be quiet now and just uh, see what questions, comments, concerns. Um, I think we, we really do need to come in there with something solid, something that will gain wide support. Um, and I know that Lynn in particular, and coming back to Dr. Shabazz's earlier question, um, the question of an earmark is uh, controversial. And it's not embraced, I don't think, by several members of the council. Um, and so we have to make a decision if we are, if that's like the hill we want to die on, or if we're willing to say it doesn't need to be, you don't need to earmark the cannabis tax revenue, but we want you because of the sort of all of the reasons we've laid out, we want you to model your yearly appropriation 
on the cannabis tax revenue. And whether you take it from there or whether you take it from your free cash, we don't care, but, but that's the base of where we want you to, you know, take it from. So I'm very curious what you all think about that. So please raise your hand if you'd like to. And I'm going to, should I keep sharing screen or I guess I should probably, I have a hard time checking attendees. Um, so if you could just give me a second, I'm going to stop the share, make sure we're good here. Okay. And then I will look for hands. Did we lose Alex? Yes, Hala, please. I don't have a, um, a constructive hand, but I do want to thank you for all that exhaustive work you're putting into this. I really appreciate that labor. Oh, thank you, Hala. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Um, any other hands right now or, and again, we have, so two things to keep in mind. We have another meeting at 2 p.m. Um, before the finance committee meeting to really solidify things. And between now and then, you can reach out to me directly. This has been daylighted. It will be in the packet. So you can reach out to me directly. Um, it's just that we can't be on like an email thread deliberating things. But um, yes, Dr. Rhodes. Well, reading between the lines in terms of what you've been saying, mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that the uh, is how do we respond to the political reality mm -hmm. in relationship to the town council, especially the chair, the president of the council, uh, Lynn, and others, but Lynn especially. Not only that, uh, we also need to be aware, and we are, I'm assuming all of us are aware, that the council uh, is in a sort of a bind going forward. And they know that uh, tw uh, fiscal 24 and fiscal 25 and 26 are gonna be really difficult years. So <clears throat> I would suggest that uh, we um, approach this by uh, your recommendation, Michelle, in terms of looking at the political reality and what is that which is going to get us down the road for fiscal 24, 25, 26, and something that the council will be able to pass. So whatever that is, we need to bring forward. I'm not uh, entirely sure what that would look like as a proposal to go forward to the town council but I certainly would like to entertain it. Thank you, Dr. Rhodes. Yeah, and I think in terms of what the proposal would look like is once we've agreed on these things that we, that, that, that are um, set for us, then this would, I would write a memo that includes a lot of background and context um, and then put this proposed policy in there. Um, and essentially it may turn out, for example, that we get a commitment based on what we've put forward, but that the policy language will need to go like through GOL, for example. I mean, when you think about this, and I don't know if you all saw, some of you may have seen the Boston Globe article today about local reparations initiatives and Amherst is highlighted in there. Um, and like we're creating, like I said, Evanston's policy was based on a resolution, um, which is fantastic that everybody has totally centered around that and, and is, is it has rallied around that and it, it's a commitment and they're moving forward with it. But in some ways, this policy that we're developing, that we're trying to enshrine into the town is 
um, something that other communities are also going to be looking at and watching for. And so it may be that the policy language has to go to, for example, GOL for working out and then through the lawyer for working out. But what we really want to make sure is that we get the main points agreed to. Um, that there's nothing here that we don't feel comfortable with. And I think the big thing here is deciding on, and again, we can propose and they can, the council can decide on something different, but what, how, when, how much in appropriations are we hoping to get from this particular funding source um, and through this policy creation here? Um, and that's the big question that I have open here. Uh, the 10% is also, I, I threw that one in there, but that, you know, that's something that can be changed, of course. Uh, yes, Dr. Shabazz. Hey, uh, I'd like to, you know, thank you as well for this document that situates the issues that um, are, are coming up via the Finance Committee um, uh, regarding this uh, uh, revenue stream we're we're discussing um <clears throat> trying to um uh as as an earmark i would say this in relation to the to the questions at hand first of all um if the policy is being reviewed from council to council i don't know why we'd have to have then a sunset on the policy the policy is already sunsetted each year you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. you're, you're only, you know, so then to say we're going to stop bringing this up uh, by X year or when X amount has been spent um, is in, in a way um, unnecessary or redundant. It's because the, the, if the policy is being reviewed from year to year, there's, there's no life to this. We can say until until 2020, or, or we can say until, you know, 2063, when the town of Amherst celebrates its tricentennial, um, but it's reviewed year to year, it could be stopped from year to year, um, you know, regardless of whether, you know, it could be stopped in, in 2024, and, and whether anybody brings it up the next year in 2025, or if it is brought up, People just say, ditto, we're not doing it this year. You know, it's so, so again, putting in a, a sunset provision on it, to me, when you've made the concession that this is reviewed and goes through, you know, a GOL and finance committee and, 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 and again, notwithstanding that you're, if you're reserving these funds, again, the actual expenditure of the funds is also in the council's hand. So I, I just really see it. I, I just really question the last bullet, the necessity of the last bullet, given the the uh, uh, the concession you're making in the in the second to the last bullet that that the that the whole policy is reviewed every year to begin with. That's that's my first reaction. Sure, and let me just respond to that a little bit, Dr. Shabazz. Um, so when I talk about the policy being reviewed by GOL um, from year to year, and I think it's important to note that at any time the council can vote to pause the program, stop the program altogether, take it completely off, you know, the um, priority list. So there's nothing that we can do that can prevent that. So what we're saying is, okay, we, we understand that reality and we understand that it will make counselors feel more comfortable if on an annual basis, and what I mean by the GOL review, just to really clarify that, and I will definitely add much more language to this, um, is that GOL would review the policy from the standpoint of, like, for example, um, if something changes from one year to the next that would impact the legality of something. Like we get our special legislation that we didn't have before. So now we're able to make direct benefits. We're able to put direct benefits out. Um, 
that would we would want to dictate that in the policy when that review happens. So it's not so much to say that, you know, actually all of the GOL reviews, all of the bylaws right now, we're about to start a process of reviewing all of the bylaws that were passed that we inherited from the last council. So I don't know if that clarifies that for you, but um, the other piece, if we don't put in a number here that we really want to hold them to in terms of a commitment or hold ourselves to as a town. And so I don't, I'm trying to take the personalization out of this. Um, then I worry that without that milestone, without that commitment, and this can even be written that beyond that point, let's say it's $2 million or whatever we, it was decided that it can be extended or it can go, you know, be <clears throat> modified. But I worry if we don't put something in there, um, that we will be at risk of, of maybe a council coming along that just kind of sees it like, oh, we're doing this review and there's only, you know, there's 500,000 in here, um, but there's nothing that tells us where we really need to get to. There's no commitment that's been made because there is some reverence given to a commitment that a previous council will have made. Um, whereas without that, I am concerned that uh, there will be less, there will be more risk for, for what we're trying to accomplish here. All right, so I'm gonna go to Alexis and then I'll come back to you, Dr. Shabazz. Um, I'm sorry if this has already been said um, because I know I've been back and forth, but um, I guess I was wondering if a like a money limit is possible instead of a time limit um, in, in the way that Evanston is like, okay, we'll raise money up to $10 million or is it like, like, I, I don't know what's, but I, I agree with Dr. Shabazz that like, it feels like it's giving people a way to kind of like snake out of this. So I don't know. No, I appreciate that. And maybe it's not clear in what I wrote here, Alexis. So it says policy to expire when appropriations have reached. So that means a dollar amount goes in there. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, not I took Dr. Shabazz's point well last time um, that putting a, a time limit on it, I don't I don't think is necessary. Um, so this was this would be like when appropriations have reached X dollar amount. And I will tell you um, that Lynn clearly stated to me, uh, you know, and, and I, I understand that everybody is coming at this, I, I do believe, with a lot of good intentions and wants to put forward a policy that is not only responsible and, and, and sustainable, but also that really is meaningful and significant. So I do think that those intentions are out there, but everybody has different ideas. But Lynn very clearly said, we've got to have, the, it, if we're going to, for example, designate cannabis tax revenue, it can't be in perpetuity. She's not going to support something that's in perpetuity. Um, so I think that that's where my thinking is, um, is that if we, we have a goal number that we're trying to get the we're trying to commit our community to our council to and our leaders to. Um, so, Dr. Shabazz. Yes, thank you. So, part of where I'm 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 looking at this, this is framed. Uh, uh, the language here currently makes it look as though this is a policy on funding reparations writ large, you know, and 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 in a way, then this. So, you know, if we set a figure, we also say that figure limits us, um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, CPA funds. So if, C if CPA proposals came in uh, in our final report that, you know, called for X amount that would go against the monies we're talking here from, from a cannabis earmark. So if, if this is a policy in relation to that specific funding stream of, of, of cannabis tax revenue, then I'd like it to be kind of, you know, 
couched in that way or expressed in that way here, because here it just looks like this is the whole general framework of, of, of all funding streams that, that you know, it, it, it expires or the, the, the council, you know, trying to grapple with it is limited to that dollar amount we set here. So right now I might could say relative to cannabis tax revenue, a figure of 2 million, okay? That if we get to two million, all right, then um, you know the the policy of earmarking or of trying to reserve uh, cannabis revenue could 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 sunset at two million. Well, that's for that. That's not then any and all reparations funding is limited to two million. And the only reason I say that is that right now I don't think we without the consultative process with the community and really getting a broader sense of, of the needs and of the harms. And it's hard to say at this juncture what the whole of, 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 of what, what, what we could be looking at is. We haven't, we haven't done that. So, to just, so, so it feels kind of arbitrary to set a cap at this point. I, again, I can set the cap if this is around, you know, the question of, how much from cannabis are we trying to draw? But if we're saying this is how much we're trying to draw from any and all funding streams, it just feels a rather arbitrary at this moment to, 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 to say this is the, is the point where we can, we can sunset our efforts. You raise an excellent point, Dr. Shabazz, and you're absolutely right. Um, this is, very much specific to the revenue stream of cannabis tax revenue. Um, and only to that, um, as I have listed up here, other sources of revenue, potentially, I would make it explicit in this memo and in the policy language um, that what we're talking about here is only in relation to that revenue stream, not any of these other potential revenue streams, um, which, by the way, I think um, as more and more support is raised for reparative justice work, there is going to be more money available um, and more um, financial support from even within CPA, for example, I think as more support um, is raised, it will be um, less challenging to get, for example, um, grants through the CPA funding. So yes to that, absolutely. Alexis. I guess I was wondering if it's putting the cart before the horse to say like, okay, does this funding stream continue until we've accomplished thing and that thing could <laughs> could <laughs> morph and could evolve and I guess is very you know in or not informed but like built by the things that reparations would be funding um like the reparations fund would be funding but um I guess I'm wondering if it's because I'm like I'm trying to like you know that's sort of like two sides of the like okay there's there's this time but also there's there's the money and and how do we you know accomplish both right so um it, it, is is there a way to say like okay like when when we see this in you know manifested then at that point this particular stream can stop or 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 is that putting the cart before the horse Irv might have some, some good answer for this, but what I would say is that in municipal government, everything goes right to the money. So there's really nothing that we can say, like when this happens, we'll, you know, because it, it's too, it's too um, like ambiguous. Um, we have to be very clear um, from a budgetary perspective, what we're trying to achieve now. With that said, I do think that our final report is going to be very explicit about the reparative justice pot, like 
full policy that we're putting in place or a full policy that we're recommending um, or the recommendations or however you want to call them. Um, and that will have more explicit detail about what we're hoping to for the community to achieve in terms of the design of the reparatory policy. Does that but, make sense? Oh, well, please. I, I, I think that I'm thinking more in terms of like, this is kind of special because it's almost like rather than like a thing, right? We can't just say like, oh, like we'll build, like we know that we're going to build this structure and it's going to, you know, it's going to do this. We're, we're almost more so like, or, or maybe, maybe I have this wrong, but I, I thought that we were like moving more towards an impact, which is less of like a thing and more of like a, how have we impacted the community? Because like, okay, great. If we like, you know, if we were to say like, okay, we're going to build a school and we're going to, you know, we're going to make a nonprofit and we're going to do this and such a thing. Like what happens if the reparations like was put into those things and then the impact wasn't what we intended to do those things. And so I guess I was wondering if, if that sort of like impact landmark could potentially be a thing, but I, I understand that it's also still kind of vague I, or, but it could potentially not be, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I think I, I think I understand what you're saying. Dr. Shabazz. Yeah, I concur with what I think I understand Alexis is saying as well. And it's, and, and really, I just wanted to elaborate on the 2 million figure. Um, I, I think in some respects, it's the parallel or comparable to Evanston given the size of our budget. So if our budget is about 90 million compared to their nearly 400 million or 360 million, then 2 million versus 10 million would be, would be a kind of a comparable amount. I'm not just going on, on the, com the comparison to Evanston. I'm also going on the ideas that right now, if we have a kind of an average coming out as about 200,000, uh, just looking over the different fiscal years here since the start of this, this revenue, then, um, then if you think about it, then that's over a 10 year period. To get to 2 million, averaging out 200,000 coming per year, then it would be about 10 years that this would run uh, before if, if the revenues averaged out at that amount. Um, that to, to, to get to get to it. So with, with 10 years in mind, with the comparison to, uh, to Evanston in mind, and, and with respect to this being <clears throat> strictly about this one particular stream and the, and the, uh, the idea of, of, of trying to get the council uh, understanding its, its, its hesitancy to, uh, to, to kind of reserve any sort of funding stream to any sort of purpose, then, uh, then with all of that in mind, that's where I, I suggest a figure of 2 million. Thank you, Dr. Spaz. Um, and how do, because as, as far as I can see here, um, if we just go through these points and maybe I've missed a point or two or more, um, and again, you can send me, I will send this out to everybody and then you can send me directly, just please do not send anything to the whole group. Um, and so I think these kind of just like the review, I think this is actually really important an annual review by the finance committee during the drafting of the budget policy guidelines that really make sure that it, this policy states that like, for example, I had a lot of frustration that the town last year appropriated $206,000 into the reparations fund but when it came time to do the budget policy guidelines, which are what Paul, our town manager, looks to to develop his budget, there was nothing in them about reparations. That's a disconnect, you know, because it, it wasn't enshrined through a policy that the finance committee had to include it. And so what we're saying here is that, and especially if, by the way, this piece here about adding a new line item in the budget for reparations, which I think it was Bob um, in the finance committee that recommended that as a possibility. As long as there's a policy in place, 
that can also happen. Okay, I saw Alexis and then Dr. Rhodes. I'm sorry, Dr. Rhodes can go before me. Okay, Dr. Rhodes. I, I was just uh, looking at your, uh, we went to three point number four uh, under the town council policy on funding reparations. Uh, policy to be reviewed by GOL for recommend recommendation at the beginning of each new council. Why GOL? Well, it doesn't have to be GOL, um, but GOL is tasked with reviewing all of the town's policies and bylaws. So like as a GOL chair, when I became a counselor and became the chair, I received a list of all the bylaws that were determined from the last council needed to be reviewed this year because it's the governance organization and legislation committee. So it reviews policies and bylaws. Yeah, but that, someone had to recommend that those policies and bylaws be reviewed. It, 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 it just doesn't automatically occur that all, all of the policies and bylaws get reviewed. There are only some that get reviewed, not all. And the question is why are some reviewed mm -hmm. and why, why not all reviewed? So um, I, my understanding is that what happens is GOL goes through the list of all the bylaws and all the policies and looks at when they were reviewed last. If there's any charter provisions or state provisions that require reviews at any certain times, you know, schedule. And then GOL basically says, here's the list. These are the ones Paul has to review as the town manager. These are the ones the council has to review. And then GOL proposes that list to the council and they adopt it. And then the next GOL gets that list based on those factors. But, you know, if the GOL review current bylaws, and say, well, we think this bylaw needs to be reviewed uh, mm -hmm. and taken to being changed or whatever, whatever. That's a huge thing. The bylaw just doesn't get changed by the council. Mm -hmm. Well, it actually, so I'll give you a good example. GOL is beginning its review of bylaws. And the first two that we're reviewing are um, one in relation to firearms and one in relation to peeping, actually, which is really interesting, um, but it had been recommended that peeping should potentially include virtual ways that somebody might peep. And so we're bringing in the appropriate people like the director of press and the, and the police chief to say, we're reviewing this bylaw. It's been recommended that we should include virtual ways that someone might peep into the bylaw. What do you think? And then We'll take that feedback and we will change it based on that. Oh, now I understand. So these are bylaws that are not bylaws that are part of the charter. Exactly. These are the town created policies and bylaws, not the state level at all. No, no, I'm talking about the charter as, a, yeah. as bylaws in it. The charter has a couple specific things. You're absolutely right. And those would have to go through like a referendum or something. <laughs> I think that's right. what you're talking about. Yeah, that's different. All right. Our policy here would be like, and I don't know if you were on Dr. Rhodes when we said this, but like if, for example, we have the policy in place and then something changes um, like we get special legislation comes through, then reviewing the bylaw, we might be able to deal with it if something needs to be added to the bylaw or to the policy, excuse me, in this case, um, to take that, that into consideration. Alexis? Oh, I think, oh, there you go. I'm sorry, I forgot to take my hand down. Oh, did your question get answered? Okay. Um, I, well, actually, do you mind if I ask the silly question? I'm no, sorry. Of course I'm trying, no. I'm trying to keep track of everything. So 
when our specific group ends, uh, this committee, there will be no committee that follows it? Or is it that BAM becomes the liaise or they, they become the community sponsors? Or is it that they become the new AHRA? Or is it that, like how, I'm sorry, I feel like I, we're backtracking a little bit, but I just wanna, I just wanna be clear if people ask me. You're actually forward thinking, not backtracking. Um, and, and that's something that will be determined. But I think in theory, our final report will include a recommendation about a successor body. So our final report, as an example, might say that a 13 member appointed body of black residents in Amherst will be the next will be the, the group essentially that's going to be like the CPA committee in a way, taking project proposals, going through the consultative process as Dr. Shabazz is with the community um, and be um, entirely made up of African heritage residents. That's one recommendation that we might make. How BAM um, kind of interacts with that, that's yet to be seen, right, as we're working through. Um, but I would I would think that there would be a crossover uh, very much so. Uh, Dr. Shabazz? Right, so I wanted to just move on to the to the other bullet item. So again, all of these are uh, are fine. If, again, bearing in mind if that little masthead is town council policy on funding reparations via cannabis tax revenues, that that's what we're talking about there, but uh, is to then come to the, the third one, uh, about the, um, the, the, the question of the financial position and, uh, and the policy in effect providing guidance uh, to, the fi to the finance committee to, uh, to look at that. I, I would like to hear or get an understanding a little more about that in relation to uh, the last meeting as, as I listened to things and it was like it was conversation first sort of went like, you know, with, with Sean Magano and with the uh, comptroller weighing in. It was like, you know, oh, no, you know, uh, what you're asking can't even be done. And then I think you pointed out, excuse me, you just did it with the last year's fiscal's budget. We're just trying to follow what are the procedures. And then it then it finally got kind of clarified, okay, well, the finance committee has to recommend an order. And then from the order that goes here and then that goes there. And then, you know, once free cash is actually certified, then you can actually then request that it be moved to, 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 to here or there. I just would say, given what I heard, that that line, that bullet item should perhaps really be tweaked to, uh, it, it's not just a matter of um, that they review it and can, and then can recommend, you know, the the uh, the appropriation go up or down. I think it's really about recommending, you know, kind of defining that whole process of the finance committee in relation to um, the process of cannabis tax revenues. You know, when they're coming in, when they go, you know, um, relative to. Um, you know, this being um, no longer contingent on the free cash process, but it now being contingent on the actual collection. So for example, what I'm saying here is, since we're talking about this specific stream and it's not having to be contingent on certification, the way I understand it, those revenues are actually collected every quarter. So, you know, perhaps then uh, you know, why does one wait until the, you know, or do you need to wait until the end of the year for that transfer uh, to happen? Or is it something that can happen even sooner than that can happen on a quarterly basis into the, because if it's, where, where is it docked when it's collected quarterly? Where is it docked? Uh, until it's moved to the general fund? Is it, is it already in some other account? So anyway, all I'm suggesting here is, is that um, you've been serving on this committee. You know the chair and Andy Steinberg. Uh, I would think 
I don't have much to say about that. Um, I think this item ought to really define the whole financial process of moving the fund, the funds, and that can, and that at some point, if you're trying to say what the assessment is about the financial position and whether you're going to then move it to this to this purpose or whether you need to to dial it back it, it's just really kind of murky to me because um you're you're, you're collecting this and you're you, you make the decision to reserve it somewhere based upon you know this is your will to do it and you just are going to be hands off this proviso seems to Not suggest moving. that if things are in the toilet or going in the toilet, then you can back off it by 10% or somebody before this meeting gets over, they may say by 25% or they may say 50%. I mean, at some point, how, how does this jive with the processes of the finance committee vis-a-vis -vis the financial health of the town. You've been on it, Herb Rhodes. You're on it now, Michelle Miller. Help me to understand how does this language really get tweaked in a way that's consistent with how town the town budget operates. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. Um, and I, you know, as you were speaking, I was getting some pretty clear guidance about um, <clears throat> I actually don't think that including this provision is necessary in the sense of an up or a down. I think that, and, and I'm obviously open to whatever you all think, but I think that what you're saying is the policy language is to outline the process, define the process. And this goes back to what I was asking you in the beginning about is the hill we want to die on um, does it have to be cannabis tax revenue or can it be modeled from the cannabis tax revenue and come from free cash? I really think the hesitation to earmark is strong enough that it will cause us some challenge. Um, particularly, I think uh, Lynn will be a lot more comfortable if we're modeling it off of the cannabis tax revenue as opposed to earmarking it. Um, so I'm really stuck about what to do there and whether or not, you know, we want to, yes, Dr. Shabazz, please. Good point. Thank you so much. Uh, in, in clarifying that modeling thing that you presented earlier. This is, this is good, but help me understand now. It, did I hear in a previous meeting that at this point, the expectation is, is that there's not likely to be any free cash off this year's budget. Is that right or wrong? No, and that's <laughs> that's the point I, I I picked up earlier in this document here, where I showed that um, it was reported in November of 2021 that we have 23.1 million dollars in reserves, which is 27 percent of the operating budget. It's uh, the guidelines says we shall keep between five and 15 percent. Um, so I have an email out to Sean and to Sonia, who brought that concern forward um, with some questions like, am I missing something here? Because they, or if they brought that concern forward, they sort of threw it out there in the meeting and it was very confusing because the policy of the town does state very clearly here that the reserve should be maintained between five and 15%. And Sonia, from what I could understand was, um, potentially uh, saying that the reserves were going to maybe dip below that. And so I don't see that being the case unless I may be missing something. And that's why I've asked the questions. Um, but I do know that the reserves are being earmarked is not the, you know, just that's not true. It's not truly being earmarked, but they're being thought of um, for the four capital projects. The reserves are being thought of for the four uh, projects. Uh, uh, yes, Irv, please. I, I, you know, I think, you know, uh, it's how money gets to, gets into the reserves. 
and how money is spent from the reserves are, are two questions. Um, and, um, and, and how did the reserves get established in the first place? Well, the uh, town council via the, uh, the, the uh, town manager and Sean, the finance director, uh, they make a proposal that X percent of the amount raised appropriations will go into uh, to, to reserves. They had a goal of 10%. And I think that goal, uh, anyway, they had a goal of 10% and it, it was for next year also 10%. So each year that amount would go into reserves. And obviously the reserves are spent not only just for rainy day things, but for capital projects that come along. And as you know, we got some uh, quite a few that are coming along. Uh, that's, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is, is, is that um, uh, in, in terms of that, which uh, in terms of budget surplus, uh, the surplus that then is declared as free cash, we will always have budget surplus. The only way we will not have budget surplus is if the town of Amherst was nuclear bombed. And the reason I say that is that it would, we'd have to have a perfect, a perfect expenditures <laughs> and everything would be on time being expended. Staff would be hired on time. Uh, projects begun on time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is almost, it, well, it doesn't occur. <laughs> Free cash occurs because of the delay in terms of implementing certain parts of the budget that has been voted on. For instance, the uh, bringing new staff on board, bringing new projects on board, et cetera. Those things always lag and that creates free cash and, and adds to the, uh, the surplus. I, the, the other thing that I wanna say is that once we have this as a policy, as with all other policies uh, that relates to the budget, the, the, uh, those policies are subject to the availability of money, A, and B, subject to the um, town manager. And we need to keep that in mind, the town manager can uh, decide not to include it in his budget recommendation. I do think from what I understand, Irv, that if, um, if it becomes a policy of the council and it gets um, put into the budget guidelines, um, it, it will be, I mean, I want to clarify with Lynn, I know that earmarking a certain um, revenue stream, if that is a policy decision, then town manager Bockelman has to do that. I don't know, however, and I will get clarification on, if we do the modeling approach and it's not officially been earmarked, but there's a policy that says it's modeled, does he have to follow? My belief is he would because he, if, if that's where those guidelines become so important um, is that they, it really has to be enshrined in a policy. And then that policy dictates what gets put into those guidelines. And I would not imagine a situation now he could come back and he could say, we're in really tough shape this year. And we're going to have to look at these different places um, to see if if we can loosen something up or like he could do that. But I'm not sure that he can just reverse or not follow the policy. It, it, um, this is going to be interesting. I mean, I don't, I don't think the charter envisions something like this, but it will be uh, something that will be interesting to see as it un unfolds. Uh, because you know, the town manager is, uh, would conceivably say, uh, you asked me to come in with a budget, I come to you with a budget. However, you have tied my hands in, in these ways uh, in terms of presenting a budget. 
And uh, therefore, um, I can't honestly come to you with a budget that I know is going to work uh, because I have this these policy guidelines in there. Now that would go back to the council and then the council would have to decide in my estimation um, what would need to be done. Would they allow this to happen or not? And I think that that's, it's just interesting from a, from a, from a political uh, standpoint, but I, I think that um, we all must realize that um, if, if we have, a, if we're going to have an opportunity to have success in this, we have to understand the political environment in which we are putting this forward, especially on the financial side of this, because the financial side, as I've said before, is something that you, you can see Len guard, guarding it, you can see Andy guarding it, and one to have all kinds of flexibility going forward in terms of uh, of this. Uh, you know, they don't want any kind of earmark. Um, and so if this if this as put forward here, uh, Michelle, if you're putting forward here, passes as a policy guideline, that would be uh, a pretty good victory. Yeah. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be a, a good victory for us. Um, and I don't know if folks have ever looked at the um, budget guidelines um, and I was gonna try to bring them up. Um, I, ha I had them up here in a different window here. Um, so I'll, I'll send them out. That's really interesting. Dr. Shabazz, please. And I just wanna note that I don't know about your time, but I do have a time limitation. Um, I'm gonna have to wrap up by 3.30. So um, sorry about that, um, but uh, Dr. Shabazz. Yeah, how, how is, is, is this was our whole agenda, right? So we yeah. don't have anything else we're looking at. And, and I know we do have one audience member or head of audience members. So we, we might have to take a couple of minutes to a few minutes to, to talk about um, public participation, public comment. But um, I just would say this, that, um, I would, um, I, I, I'm, I've tried to understand what I hear as the pushback to the idea of a specific earmark around cannabis. I, dis I still disagree with it. Um, I, you know, Lynn uh, uh, Greismer or any other counselors on the finance committee or within the 13 member body have an opinion and I respect their opinion. I respect their, their, their history. I respect their, you know, but I've, I've overseen budgets too, as I was saying in the meeting, I've been around when there've been years of rescission and, um, and I'm being told to do models of reducing my budget 10%, 5%, 3%. I've been there, okay? But the, the idea of trying to make a binding commitment of this particular revenue stream of the cannabis tax revenue, to me, um, they're, they're, they're concerns that I've heard raised, precedent setting, uh, ties hands of future councils, uh, this, that, and the other, um, they don't impress me because <laughs> When the times are hard, then the very, you know, that's often when the kind of fund we would be wanting this, this dedicated earmark to build is gonna be as more necessary than ever when those times are that, are that hard and that difficult. But now we're throwing our hands up and saying, you know, because, you know, let's give them, let's, let's ask them to not, make a binding commitment of this revenue stream, but we're just gonna kind of model it and do it out of this free cash process when it looks okay and when, when, when they can all feel comfortable about it after the budget year has gone through and, and they can still kind of tweak it with what they put in. It, that's, to me, you can call it 
any of you can call it an enormous victory, this policy. I still look at it as an enormous defeat. It's an well, enormous defeat on the moral grounds, not so much on the, on the financial grounds. We've seen free cash come through. I give you that. And if it can come through again this year, I'll be even more happy with it. But I'm saying on a moral ground, when I heard Councillor Alicia Walker and her expressing her view of the justice of putting the fund, of putting cannabis revenue, binding ourselves to put it into this reparative justice process, that to me is, is what I want to hear out of my council, not you know, and, 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 and it's the other side of the argument, so to speak, to what the others so far have raised. But again, I'll go along with it if it's the will of this body to, to uh, take, to take this, this more free cash approach, but, but I go with the will of the group. Earth? All right, uh, in the background of all of this, and when you talk to certain town officials, including Lynn and Paul, and Andy, in the, the, the background is, hey, you guys, i.e. African-American community, we gave you crest. And now you're coming wanting more money for uh, reparations. And why? And, and do you want to cause a battle between these two in terms of who gets funded? What is going to be the priority? In other words, looking at it as if, you know, and, and you know, Lynn would say, well, Crest is for the whole community, but in their minds, the budget is already has a huge uh, appropriation for quote, for unquote, the African-American community. And, and why would we want to then go and have another earmark for that community? And that is a backdrop. And you know, and you can hear it uh, if you listen close enough to the people on the finance committee, Lynn, Paul, etc. Alexis, I, 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 I'm going to say I, that I agree with Dr. Shabazz, and here's why: I feel like, why did they make us then? Like, why, why are we doing this work? I feel like then it's it kind of comes back to this sort of like, like, didn't you make, like put us together to do this? And so I'm wondering like, if I, it, it's sort of, for me, it feels like, well then like, what about the commitment and what about, I don't know. I don't wanna, I don't wanna say, cause I know that we have a time crunch, but like, it feels like that's sort of like the opposite of what they made us to do. Um, and so they're kind of like being hypocrites if that's the case. Um, so yeah, I, I, I feel like too, like, is, are we, are we really going to be hurt if we, if we ask for the earmark and they say, no, can't we come back? I mean, like, I know that it's like a deadline that we're hoping for, but like, what if we get it? I don't know. And let me speak. Yeah. Let me speak to this because from the person that's on this committee that's also the legislator on the council. I want to be able to tell you what I'm thinking. Um, so the process is the finance committee has to make a recommendation and they take that recommend and they don't have to remember I was even saying that I felt like I wanted to push it through without the recommendation because but that's not sort of the general practice. It, the practice is that the finance committee makes a recommendation. They're the experts that have been, you know, sort of tasked with really um, re understanding the town's financial condition. And there are at least a couple counselors, if not three, <laughs> um, on that committee that have these strong concerns that we're bringing forward. As far as the full council, I do feel like there's a very good chance of success in the council approving the earmark. 
So the question is that interim step of getting the recommendation from the finance committee, if we have the risk tolerance in us to say, if the finance committee comes out with a recommendation that says we're not doing the earmark and we're still willing to move to the full council with that request, and hope that we get it passed and that those counselors who aren't comfortable with it somehow convince something otherwise. I really do feel like what you, Dr. Shabazz, what you're saying, Alexis, about the moral piece of this is it, it is really important. And um, I have the risk tolerance to do that, but I feel like partially as that person that's playing both roles. I feel such an enormous sense of responsibility to you all. I can't even tell you. And I want to get it right. I don't want to misstep. And so um, I would be happy to come into the finance committee and really fight hard for the earmark. Um, and then if the recommendation doesn't happen, um, in the way that we were hoping for, still come to the council and still ask for that and let the council decide. But ultimately, the more consensus we can get um, with the members of the finance committee, particularly with the chair of the um, council and the chair of the finance committee, um, the better off just overall we're going to be. Um, it doesn't mean it's not possible, but so I'm trying to find a place, you know, maybe what we do is we go in and we ask for the earmark as we have from the beginning. And if the modeling question comes up, we'll all be there together at that meeting and we'll be able to sort of consult together with the finance committee around that. Um, and Dr. Shabazz, I see your hand. Quick follow up. I know we got a hard stop. I'll just say this, you know, clearly for this year, if anything, we're trying to pull from free cash for the the budget that was already that's already in process of being voted on for next year. It's it would have to come out of free cash because we weren't in the budget guidelines back in November, even though December, whatever, even though we made the, our recommendation back in November, it it was not it was not taken up for that. So you know, for two years out, we're definitely looking at free cash, I would even stipulate for 2024, we don't have to, we wouldn't have to start the earmark. We could continue to be on uh, on the certified free cash. We could, we could call for the timing of this to start in fiscal year 2025 for the earmark of cannabis or 2026, if we think we might be out of, uh, you know, away from the cliff by then, uh, Irv, uh, Dr. Rhodes, you know, uh, and everyone, if, if it's 2026, we think we'll be out of the cliff. Let's call for the earmarking to begin then. And we go by this free, this free cash modeling process. But, but the objective, I would still say, to push for is the earmark, even if we want to date it as starting 2025 or the 2026 fiscal year. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. Irv, did you? I see your mouth moving. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm for the modeling. I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking at what is, what is the politically possible, uh, and that once you have that in, the moral questions come up in relationship to the council in terms of funding this, and you make that you put that moral responsibility right on them. And, and I think if we are explicit, you have to leave Alexis. Yeah, I gotta go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> we'll see you at two o'clock on Tuesday, okay? Thank you. Um, I think if we are stating that that base amount that we want is, that has a real history, a real root that we can point our finger to that came from somewhere that came as, <clears throat> um, an intention through all the stuff that we've talked about, the, the justice reasons and the, the moral and ethical reasons that we've talked about for cannabis being, and, and you know, Jennifer's not here, but she pointed out to us, I think that 
you know, the cannabis, we don't know how um, dependable it's going to be either. Uh, I think it's going to be pretty dependable personally, but um, it's hard to tell because of how many shops are opening. So maybe there's some hybrid uh, and I really appreciate the intention that you, you brought forward, Dr. Shabazz, um, looking at, you know, giving some flexibility, some hybrid um, where, you know, there's both can be happening. So let's kind of all sit with that. And then we'll, I'll further develop based on the feedback you've given me these written pieces and we'll see how it kind of all comes together. Um, but, you know, we, if we get to the finance committee and we ask for the earmark, they can say, we're going to do the, we'd rather recommend the model. And then we can, they can put that in their recommendation and then we can get to the town council and we can, I have an idea, by the way, um, <laughs> that I was thinking I'm going to blast out to like the 500 people on the reparations mailing list that I have and wanted to know what you all thought about what if we ask people to come to the meeting during public comment with a symbol next to their name. And I don't know if you can do that on Zoom, so I have to check it out, but maybe it's a cannabis leaf um, or some symbol next to their name. Not everybody's gonna raise their hand to speak at public comment, but for the counselors to see that people have come out and showed their support for this um, in a very visual way, because as counselors, we can see everybody that is there in the room and participating. Um, so we can talk about that more, but um, well, maybe we can't. So hopefully that's not a problem for anybody. Uh, RJ, it, RJ, RJ, <laughs> reparative justice, RJ. Oh, I love that. Yeah, like exactly. That's perfect um, because I don't even know if visual symbols are okay, but RJ is a great idea. Um, and if every, does everybody like that? RJ, does that work for people? Okay, cool. And then I can say, you know, cause they'll see maybe 10, 20, 30, 40 people that all have that, that are there. Just, just a way to, for people to stand there with us on that day. And if we, if the recommendation comes and says that there'd rather be a model, we can still request the earmark from the full town council with that recommendation. And we can see what gets decided, you know. Um, I do have to call for public comment. Um, and so if you, um, there's one attendee and if you'd like to make public comment, oh, okay, no attendee. <laughs> All right. So if there aren't any other questions or comments, um, what's that? Move to adjourn. Yes, I move to adjourn at 3.33. Thank you all very much. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs>